The Salmonid Association of Eastern Newfoundland, or SANE, is a registered not-for-profit organization dedicated to the conservation of salmonids in Newfoundland and Labrador, including salmon and trout. SANE relies on its membership of volunteers to work with other conservation partners, government departments, and communities to help ensure the continued return of wild Atlantic salmon to our province's rivers. Hi, my name is Jim Din. I'm president of the Salmonid Association of Eastern Newfoundland. Uh, I've been on the board of directors for the last year and I got involved primarily, I guess, to meet the more of the members and uh, to uh, learn a few more fishing places and a few more fishing techniques and uh, uh, things like that and also to get involved with the, the conservation work uh, that, the, um, that, the, that the that SANE or the Salmonid Association does. I've been long term, I guess, involved with it because through this gentleman here, uh, Ian Gall, and Ian has been around from what I gather since the founding of uh, of the uh, of the association. So he can probably tell you a little bit more about the long history and the long term work that they've done. Uh, the association started in the late 1979. I was interested in conservation, and uh, I got a call from Ray Simmons, who used to be. Uh, the sports editor uh, in the Telegram. Ray mentioned that uh, there was an organisation going to start up with a background of conservation for salmon and sea trout and uh, brown trout. After a while the uh, association was formed and uh, the first meeting was held in uh, Queen's College in, uh, at Memorial. The first uh, big project we were engaged in was the Rocky River project down near Colonnet. Mm. The, uh, initially the, the plan was to enhance the, the river there. There was no actual salmon one. There was a salmon ladder which was built by the Americans in uh, Gentia. Oh, I didn't know that. And uh, this uh, salmon ladder did not uh, fit the bill, as you, you might say. It, uh, it was quite a big uh, project. Rocky River is a pretty, got a pretty yeah, steep fall, right? Rocky River got very steep falls there, and uh, in addition to Rocky River, uh, we had the uh, availability of the old spawning channel on the North Harbour River for the uh, the fish that was uh, taken from the Little Salmon Air River, uh, was placed in the spawning channel on the North Harbour River, and once the uh, fish spawned, the fry was taken to the Rocky River, and through the years, uh, I think the biggest one we had was something like uh, 500 fish. So, what do you think? From your, you've been at this a lot longer than I have. So, uh, I, I guess, what would be the project that you are most proud of? I think? I'd say the last five years, to uh, we have been involved with uh, uh, some wounded uh, Canadian soldiers mm. from uh, Project Healing Waters. They're all. Uh, veterans, uh, several are veterans of uh, Afghanistan, Bosnia, and uh, well, most of them suffer from PTSD, and uh, we started meeting with them once a week, about five years ago, Frank Walsh and myself, uh, we come up to the office with tight flies, actually it, uh, it's quite, uh, to me it's quite a rewarding even. I also was involved quite a bit in uh, the started uh, river cleanups, mostly on the lower Waterford River, and uh, it was quite rewarding to be engaged in that, and uh, people would come down and more or less ask, what are you doing? Said, oh, we're cleaning up the water, Waterford River, the banks and the river itself and stuff, and it's amazing how uh, so people you know, locked on to it, uh, we were doing quite a good job of uh, cleaning up the environment. Because yeah. uh, initially, in the Waterford River, uh, you couldn't be surprised, because some of the things we found, it was unbelievable. Uh, various things, carts from the oh, right. supermarkets. Uh, uh, there was one pool that the boys used to call the mattress pool, because there was a mattress floated down the river. We, we cleaned the place up quite a bit and uh, this year we've had a, we started a, it was, it through Jim Burton an award a recognition award for 
uh, the person or people or groups of people who best promote and practice catch and release. That's a relatively new one that Jim Burton has uh, done up, but we've had a longer, uh, long-standing award that's, got, uh, that's presented at the Moose Stew Supper, and that's the Gunter Bear Award. I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about yes, that, uh, Ian. Gunther, Gunther Bear was a German who was uh, one, also one of the founding members, and uh, Gunther, uh, he was uh, well known in fishing and hunting uh, circles. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Gunther wasn't uh, around very long. It was, uh, it was only a few years after we started that uh, Gunther uh, took sick and he passed away. And in, in his memory, we uh, brought out this uh, Gunther Bear Award, which we continue to award uh, yep. up to this day. Of course, projects like these require significant funding if they are to be successful. The annual Gunter Bear Moose Stew Supper in November and the annual dinner and auction in the spring, now in its 30th year, are SANE's main fundraising events. SANE also relies on funding partners and organizations like the Atlantic Salmon Conservation Foundation, or ASCF. Established in 2007, the ASCF promotes enhanced community partnerships in the conservation of wild Atlantic salmon and its habitat in Atlantic Canada and Quebec. It provides funding to community volunteer organizations and helps these groups work together with government and Aboriginal organizations to plan and manage wild Atlantic salmon conservation. I'm Stephen Chase. I'm Executive Director of the Atlantic Salmon Conservation Foundation. We're a granting organization that uh, provides money to conservation groups, First Nations, municipalities, university researchers in the five eastern provinces, Quebec and the four Atlantic provinces. We fund projects such as those that are being carried out by the Salmonid Association of Eastern Newfoundland, uh, you know, this video, but also in the uh, Rennies River behind us, we've helped fund uh, the improvements to the fishway in that project, and also projects uh, that has involved watershed uh, planning uh, throughout the Rennies River uh, watershed incubation boxes and so on. So these are examples of the kinds of projects that we help organizations uh, improve salmon conservation. With support from ASCF and other programs, partners and volunteers, SANE has undertaken significant projects to increase the numbers of returning salmon to rivers in eastern Newfoundland. This includes a major restoration and education program in Rennie's River in St. John's. My name is Jim McCarthy and I'm a senior biologist with a local company here in Newfoundland. I'm also a PhD student at the University of New Brunswick and I'm currently the chair of the projects committee for the Sam Association of Eastern Newfoundland. The association's been doing an incredible amount of work on conservation for Atlantic salmon and brown trout and brook trout. And recently in the last seven years, the main focus has been on Rennie's River. That's included river cleanups, modification to the falls behind me here, uh, enhancement of spawning habitat further upriver and general education, giving people an understanding of the habitats of Atlantic salmon. We've also been monitoring the smolt that are coming out of the system to get an idea of uh, the success of the transplants that we're doing. Uh, and recently we've, we've gone from a very heavy manual smolt fence to a video system that we've installed in the city's fishway that goes around the dam behind me. A big part of the association's uh, mandate is to provide uh, education and uh, different workshops. So for example we have river talks where we'll have speakers come in and talk about various rivers, uh, how to fish them, where to fish them, uh, best access points. Uh, we also do a lot of river cleanups um, throughout the province. Uh, we've recently been down to North Harbour River, South River and here in Rennies River and Waterford River. Not only are there lots of projects being completed by Salmon Association and other conservation organizations and volunteer groups, but there's also a lot of salmon restoration activities being completed by industry in Newfoundland and Labrador. Of course, everybody knows the fishways that are on the Exploits River at Bishop's Falls and Grand Falls. Before they were constructed, Atlantic salmon only had access to the lower part of the river, and the estimates are that there were probably a couple thousand salmon now with these fishways, there's tens of thousands of Atlantic salmon heading up through the headwaters of the Exploits River. There's another fishway on the Exploits system that most people aren't aware of at Red Indian Lake. There's an actual elevator system that fish swim into it, 
and they physically get lifted up above the dam and, and brought over the dam into Red Indian Lake so that they can continue their migration up through Lloyds River. There's been more work done on Exploits River by mining companies who removed tens if not hundreds of cords of wood from some of the tributaries so that salmon could access that habitat again and the streams can flush and provide suitable spawning locations. There was hydroelectric developed in the early 2000s in central Newfoundland and the company actually built almost two kilometers of Salmon River. Uh, it contains side channels that were designed for brook trout spawning. Those were built to help support a run of landlocked Atlantic salmon called Wananish out of the Mealpeg Reservoir System that estimates are the numbers are close to 30,000 fish. Uh, on the south co coast, there's a local mining company who is re-establishing an Atlantic salmon run in a small stream near St. Lawrence. They've committed to keeping the mouth of the river open from big storms that push all the beach material up and block the river off. They've added spawning gravels and they've increased access by removing some of the obstructions that were put there in the past that are no longer needed, such as small dams for water supplies. Now a lot of the projects that are developed by industry are a result of them requiring a regulatory process and permission through the Fisheries Act to complete their developments. Basically it's determined that their projects can't proceed without them harming either Atlantic salmon habitat or reducing the population productivity of a, a local river. And as a part of the requirement of being able to develop their project, they have to provide these offsets. A DFO plays an instrumental role in developing these offsets for industry in that they ensure that they review the projects, they review the design, the scientific rationale, and the potential success of these projects. DFO ensures that the monitoring programs, that the design, the construction are all uh, completed so that the programs are very successful. The monitoring programs ensure that anything that's learned or that doesn't quite work as planned uh, are addressed and, and changed and modified so that the, the programs are a success. So there's a lot of involvement in salmon restoration and enhancement uh, that involves a lot of regulatory control and a lot of checks and balances so that industry is involved and they can produce uh, first-rate Atlantic salmon conservation. Despite these efforts, annual returns of Atlantic salmon to many of our Newfoundland rivers have been in steady decline. The consequences of continuing declines is grim and highlights the need for a much better understanding of the risks facing the species, as well as a greater emphasis and action on salmon conservation. Sadly, in, in uh, the last 30, 40 years, we've noticed a significant decline in salmon populations. You know, in all of the five provinces, uh, each of those provinces has a unique set of uh, uh, conservation issues. Uh, but the decline has come about for many reasons. Uh, global warming, uh, loss of habitat, siltation, elevated water temperatures, uh, and a myriad of reasons that uh, have caused the de significant decline in salmon populations. Importantly, we rely on, and I say we, the collective, we rely on conservation organizations like SANE uh, to carry out this conservation activity. I mean, it's very clear that government can set a very good policy and they can provide some funding mechanisms, but the actual work on the ground really depends on committed organizations like SAM. So the key thing with us is we're always looking for new members, a variety of members, younger members uh, <coughs> that can help us carry on a lot of the projects. It's uh, like any organization, uh, we're all uh, an aging group of people, but uh, we believe conservation is far too important just to let the uh, let an organization like SANE uh, pass away uh, or you know fade into a non-existence. So one of the things we do, uh, uh, and I've taken my cue from uh, uh, from Ian here, is go to uh, and actively seek people uh, to uh, get involved. So um, we have our AGM coming up this week, and uh, we're hoping to have a few new board members uh, to complement the. Uh, uh, the veterans on the uh, on the uh, board, uh, so that we can ca keep on uh, with the projects that we've uh, undertaken, that we hope to keep on undertaking, uh, taking on in the future. 
it's very important that communities be actively involved in salmon conservation. And most communities, there are there is a salmon river, and there's many communities where there actually is the nucleus of a salmon conservation organization. You don't have to be an angler to be involved in salmon conservation. You just have to be interested in the environment. I mean, it helps to be an angler, but there's, there's nothing more beautiful than a river like this. You know, to, be, uh, to feel good about helping contribute towards its sustainability. It's very important for people to get involved. It's part of the culture in Atlantic Canada, and it's protecting that culture for future generations that's so important. And that's the key part to our, uh, I guess, our own reputation. Uh, it's, we're not an anglers organization, even though we do an awful lot of activities that uh, promote angling and uh, as, as fly tying, rod building, uh, project healing waters, but we're all, uh, our primary purpose is to promote conservation and that's the thing we're most proud of. Catch and release angling practices have been used since the 1800s, but it wasn't until 1984 that it became mandatory in Newfoundland and Labrador to release all large salmon, greater than or equal to 63 centimeters in fork length. While catch and release angling has routinely been permitted on rivers where salmon populations have been below established conservation levels, even catch and release angling is prohibited when water temperatures rise above threshold temperatures on the province's rivers. Still, there are many environmental and technique related factors that can impact the survival of a salmon following catch and release. Awareness of these factors is critical. In the excitement of landing a salmon, it is easy for an angler to injure the fish unintentionally and unknowingly decrease its chances for survival. In this segment, we will demonstrate the best practices for playing, landing, handling, and releasing a salmon to give it the best chance of survival. As well, we'll look at some things that should be avoided to prevent injury to the fish. Oh, hi, we're down here at the river to talk about catch and release salmon angling. Now, as our salmon stocks start to dwindle from overfishing pressure and loss of habitat and loss of juveniles out at sea, we want to practice catch and release so fish can live to spawn and fight another day. Now, for the intent of this video, we've been donated a dead salmon so we can show you what not to do so we're not harming this fish. This was one used in an experiment at the university. Now, when you're doing salmon angling, make sure you check the regulations. Even for catch and release, there are limits. You can't fish continually. There's usually rivers have certain limits. You can catch a certain number of fish and then you must stop fishing. Remember to follow all the guidelines using barbless hooks, the correct tackle and such like. Now with catch and release, we recommend using a net rather than beaching a fish. If you're beaching a fish, it may flop around in the shallows, it can injure itself on, its rock, on the rocks. So we recommend trying to use a net to net your fish. Now we'll discuss some of the net types. Now this first net is an economy net. You can pick this up usually in any general store or supermarket. We don't recommend using this type. It's a nylon net. If you feel the mesh, it's quite hard and there's lots of knots on it. This knots can damage the fish scales or the slime. So we recommend using one of the following two nets. Now there's this soft mesh net. As you can see, it's a lot very finer. It's made of soft cotton mesh, smaller holes and no knots on it. And so this is a lot safer for the salmon. It doesn't remove the slime to the same degree. This net is not quite as hardy as the next net. It's softer. It can bend a lot. If you're walking through the brush, it might rip on brambles. The best net, probably the most expensive one, is this net here. As you can see, it has a large, deep pouch to land the fish in so they can't jump out and injure themselves. It's made of a soft silicon net so it won't damage the fish. And you can hold these effectively in the water so you can keep the fish respiring while you get ready to measure and have your photos taken. So you've landed your salmon, keep it in the net and keep it submerged in the water. This way it can aerate itself. Remember, you've just caught the salmon, it's been swimming around the river. It's similar to you running the 400 meter dash and then somebody put you underwater in the swimming pool. So don't keep it out of water. This animal needs to get oxygen back into its blood. Now you have your salmon here safely 
it's safely held in the net, it's getting oxygenated. If you want to measure it, have your tape measure handy. And with the fish still in the net, measure it in the net. Now what you want to do before you touch the salmon is make sure your hands are wet. Now salmon are covered in, and all fish are covered in slime. This is a protective slime, it has antibacterial properties. It keeps germs from getting into the fish. The fish also have scales which are protective. You don't want to handle the fish with dry hands because this could remove some of the protective slime and all the scales. So make sure the hands are wet before you go in and you measure your fish. You will notice in the video no one used gloves. For many years it was thought that a wool or cotton glove should be used since it allowed a better grip on the fish. However, it is now thought that these types of gloves can remove the protective slime on a fish's body and expose it to parasites and disease. It could take weeks for a fish to die after the loss of its protective slime, allowing fungus or other infections to enter the salmon's body and take their toll. And while there are commercially available fish handling or fish tailing gloves, many are intended for use in retaining a fish. They have little or no scientific basis as to their degree of preventing slime removal. Our best advice, when handling a fish for catch and release, minimize handling and use bare, wet hands with no glove. So you've measured your fish. Quite often people want to then get a photograph with their fish before it's released. Again, we'll show you ways you shouldn't handle fish in proper ways. In the net, it helps if you have a buddy. Support the fish in the net. One round, its tail, and then we often just support it underneath the heart or gill region. And then lift it up for a photo. You should have your camera ready or your buddy ready with the camera to photograph it. And then you can put it back into the water. Keep it out of the water for a minimal amount of time. Let it recover slowly in the net. Once you've got your photos, your length and weight, you'll be ready to release it. Find a deep pool where it can be released keeping the fish in the water, keep the head pointing upstream so water is flowing over the gills. Allow the fish to resuscitate. It may need a minute or two in the water. When you feel it kicking, let it swim out of your hands into freedom. So this is the best way to practice safe catch and release. And some people have asked what happens if we're practicing catch and release and somehow the fish dies or doesn't look very well. Well, if the fish dies and you're on the catch and release river or it's oversized, you have to release it no matter what. These are the regulations. People say, well, this could be a bit of a waste of fish. But at the same time, that fish, when it dies in the river, it breaks down lots of insects, bugs and worms. They'll eat that fish. And then, then in turn, they'll become food for the new salmon fry or salmon car. And now we're going to show you what not to do, not how to handle the fish. We've shown you the safe, correct methods. For this intent purposes, we've been donated a salmon, so we can show you what to do and what not to do, so the animal isn't suffering. As we said, you've got your fish in the net. Don't lift the fish out so you can see it, because potentially different things can happen. Fish can flap around or drop. You can drop it on the side, and this, of course, is going to injure or kill the fish. Likewise, you don't want to lift the fish out and have for your photo. You want to kneel down. So this is not what to do with a fish. You don't want to have the fish out of the net because a fish wriggles. If the fish is wriggling, what can happen? Oops! You drop it in and of course then you've injured the fish. Likewise, the fish wriggles. The thing you tend to do is pull the fish in and then grab and squeeze the fish. First thing is it's slippery, so your hand goes into the gill covers. And this is where you could damage the fish. The squeezing of the fish, you could rupture the heart, which is just underneath the neck here. Moreover, your fingers go into the gills and the delicate gill covers, and you'll damage the gills. And this usually kill the fish. So you don't want to be kicking the fish up for your photo. Take it out the net while you're kneeling down. When you're holding the fish, you don't hold it by the tail either. This will cause the organs to pull down against gravity and it could rupture delicate blood vessels. And of course, you could also drop it. Secondly, never want to hold a fish like this from the gill covers. This will kill the fish. It'll rip the delicate gills and it'll start to bleed out. So there are specific ways. Keep your fish low in the water. 
you don't need to be holding it like this for catch and release. Catch and release should be down in the net, in the water, it's just out for a few seconds. Some people want to weigh their fish. If you have to weigh it, I think it might be your personal best, weigh it in the net. Have your scale close by and handy, keeping the fish in the water. Quickly lift the fish and the net out of the water, take your weight and put the fish back into the water. You can then subtract the empty net and get a weight for your fish. So remember, look after these fish and we'll have fish for future generations.